Hello and welcome. My name, Robert Jones, and I'm here to tell a tale about life and death, both of them mine. I was born at a tender age in a higgledy piggledy haven on Honeycomb Hill. The way in which my father had met my dear mamma was as strange as it was unique for he only had one eye on which he could rely, having lost the other to an errant catapult aged 13, eight weeks, six days, four minutes and two seconds. For decorative and practical purposes, my at times flamboyant father wore a bright rose-colored monocle on the eye on which he could rely. It was via this crystal spectacle he first saw my dear mamma performing in a melodrama in a noted playhouse just shy of Drury Lane. Accepting his proposal after high tea at the Ritz, he took her to a chapel in Ipswich where they tied the knot that time forgot. It was not long into their marriage that my father's once permanently fixed monocle was lost in the eye of a storm, thus revealing a different version of my mother to the one he had received through the magical lens. Her nose was long and hooked, Mama was not the way she looked, and to my father more's the pity, she was anything but pretty. But for loyalty, my father chose to stick with Ma and her huge nose. And when I was born with a similar nose to Mama, but much bigger, my father encouraged me to take pride in my all-encompassing appendage. This is when I began to practice the fine art of nosology. <laughs> Yes, I'm a man who knows his noses, thanks to Pa. He said, my son, I have a nose for who you are. But you must exercise that beak 100,000 times a week. And if you don't, my boy, you won't go very far. If you follow your nose, wherever it goes, you'll be a master in the fine art of nosology. And so I stretched it, then I flicked it with my tongue. I often licked it, so to keep the flaring nostrils nice and clean. I had contraptions made of metal that would keep me in fine fettle. Twas the biggest nose the world had ever seen. <laughs> Now I could follow my nose, which was so huge it touched my toes. I was the master in the fine art of nosology. And now your nose is at its best. It's time for you to flee the nest, my father told me as we settled down for supper. My poor mama began to cry. I was the apple of her eye. But like my father, she agreed that I should scupper. I'm sure on reflection she meant scupper, but it didn't rhyme. You have a master's in nosology, a penchant for psychology, specific, your terrific sense of smell. Hmm. So when you're out in the community, take heed of opportunity. You're bound to open doors with that enormous snout of yours. And as to be expected, my papa then interjected. Now if you follow your nose as your mucosa clearly shows, you are a master in the fine art of nosology. Well, well done, well, well, you. Oh yes, those nasal exercises brought me wealth and more surprises. My big beak was quite a catch, without a doubt. For when I went out proudly walking, I'd hear passing people talk about the width and girth of my enormous snout. <laughs> 
I had a huge nose for success. It was no calculated guess. It brought me Stella, Lou, Loretta, Sue, and Hazel. They liked to touch it day and night, for my huge thing was quite a sight. Yes, I attribute my rewards to all things nasal. <laughs> it brought me Catherine, Tess, Karina, Bess, Carminia, and Rebecca. All enraptured, they were captured by my pretty pointed pecker. Sometimes I'd resurrect them with my deviated septum. Day and night they'd wait politely at my door. And with my bulbous membrane pulsing, they'd be writhing and convulsing. I was something of a nasal raconteur. I wrote a feature in a noted academic magazine about a man who had the biggest nose the world had ever seen. So far I'd followed my nose, no time for respite or repose. I was the master in the fine art of nosology. With my career path on the turn, high regal courtiers would yearn to seek an audience with my renowned extension. The royal artist touched my nose and then commissioned me to pose for a fine fee that's frankly far too much to mention. In a most acclaimed academy, a picture of my pecker was well hung for all the hoi polloi to see. Oh yes, it got me so excited, I was courted and invited to be wined and finally dined by royalty. Oh, I could tell toe-curling tales about the portly Prince of Wales. Yes, I rubbed shoulders with them all, each one in awe. And there was much anticipating, for the ladies were in waiting, as they'd never seen one quite that big before. But I was sure to keep my flaming nostrils clean, for the inspection of Her Majesty the Queen. When she stroked it for an hour or more, it felt so firm and strong. That's why she said, My boy, it's not just wide, it's also very long. Why, thank you, Mom. I'm not a hair in sight. She sighed. Your pecker's perfect, pure and plucked. That's why she took it somewhere private and requested to be f f far away from the Prince of Wales and all his ghastly phonies, who she incessantly pronounced as cads and crows. It was then she poked and prodded and routinely Queenie nodded in approval of a fabulous reward. Then with a twinkle in her eye, I heard the lovely lady cry. My faith in quality and size has been restored. <laughs> oh yes, I followed my nose, thus causing charismatic glows. I was the master in the fine art of nosology. The next day, I was flummoxed when informed that I had nasal competition. For a duchess in my clutches claimed that academic scribes were on a mission. To prove that there was a man who had a more impressive nose than I! I was most concerned, I must confess. My muddled mind was in a mess. I tried to take stock, but it was very difficult for me because my father had taught me the art of nosology, and I had honed it, and I had made something of my life, and now I was most concerned. As for the Duchess, she said, A writer with a poison pen is printed in the press. You must refute these claims at once, or your career path will digress. Like a cured schizophrenic, you'll only be half the man you used to be. <laughs> no longer the master of nosology. I never did like the Duchess of Bristol. Anyway, I must tell you about the feature that was written about me. It was no ordinary article, but quite a detailed feature. 
replete with putrid portraits of a mind-corroding creature. What's more, the man in question clearly came from lower stock, but I could not let the Duchess comprehend my state of shock. You seem to be taking this very well, considering you might end up being a failure. This man we're reading about, blood off, appears to have a whopper. And if it's true what they all say, then you could come a cropper. Nah, 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 nah. She really, really used to get my goat. It was at this point I told the stupid bitch, Pah! This man, Bladenov, he's a fake. No, he's not. Pro you, you got to prove that. I retorted, of course. I said, I agree, it appears he has a big one. But it's nowhere near the size of mine. And these are only a series of portraits. The man who created these paintings is clearly merely using artistic license apropos of my appendage. Well, that's what you say, but you gotta prove it. Na, 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 na. The Duchess then suggested I came face to face with Bladenov who she'd invited to the royal ball. Your appendages all measure. It will be my candid pleasure for to settle this debate once and for all. And then we'll know who you really are and whether your claims are true. Yeah, 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 yeah. Murderous thoughts came into my head at that very moment. And it was that West Country wench I had in mind, and strangulation being the method of murder I would employ. She continued to encourage me to be measured against this blood enough. I think you should both be measured, and the winner will be treasured forever in the day! Nah, 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 nah. Reluctantly, I agreed to the hapless competition hoping, of course, that the artist's impression in the said journal had been a huge exaggeration, and that my reputation for being the master of nosology would remain intact. I was introduced to Bladenov whilst at the royal ball, and to my horror, his proboscis was gigantic. My reputation torn and tattered, I felt shafted, shamed and shattered. My poor state of mind was dark and somewhat frantic. It's nice to meet you, said my rival. I then questioned my survival as the Duchess reappeared with her yardstick. It was then that she suggested that our prowess should be tested. I felt nauseous, cautious, cumbersome and sick. He looks as sick as a parrot, he does. <laughs> I can assure you, I can assure you, it, it's only stage fright, you, you, you Bristolian bastard. No, 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 temper, temper, may the best man win. <laughs> what made things worse, I lost the contest by no more than half an inch. That's why I raised my hand before his face and gave his snout a pinch. From here on it's rather simple, for I must have pinched a pimple, causing blood and pus to splat across the wall, creating mayhem at the wretched royal ball! Then Bladinov retorted when he struck me with his cane across my arse as time would pass. My bleeding buttocks were in pain. So much pain. So much pain. I strike you on your bottom even though I like you. Oh, I felt him so patronizing. And yes, it's true. I'd followed my nose. But it had all come to a close. He was the master in the fine art of nosology. I couldn't believe it myself. I am the winner of the championship, the biggest one of them all. <laughs> 
after basking in the glory of being the newly discovered master of nosology, Bladinoff approached me in the thriving cock tavern one Sunday afternoon and offered to bury the hatchet, so to speak. But the only thing I wanted to bury was the hooter that protruded from his mind-corroding face. I suggested that the findings of the contest was a fix, and the Duchess in my clutches had been playing dirty tricks. That's quite ridiculous, said Bladinoff. I came here to placate you, and despite these allegations, I still find it hard to hate you, for I studied your techniques for stretching noses, snouts, and beaks. You were my mental muse and idol from the start. For me to see you suicidal breaks my heart. Making things worse, his disingenuous friend was there with a smug look in his eye, making comments I did not like at all. I can assure you of the veracity of that, because I actually went to school with Bladinoff, and he idolized Mr. Jones. He is Mr. Jones, and he's the loser now. Nah, 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 nah. Leave me alone, let me be. I could not believe what I was hearing. This bounder had tenaciously studied my acclaimed article on nosology and beat me at my own game. Enough was enough. And to make things worse, he had humiliated me in front of a rammed cock tavern. Now, everyone's eyes were fixed on me, all eager to see how I would respond to Bladinov's revelation. I would not do it with my fist, so I produced a pair of pistols, for I found this cad duplicitous and cruel. He was a man I most detested, for he stole what I invested. That is why I then suggested we should duel. It was then that Bladinov agreed to meet the next day in a field. My heart and soul would be my pride and joy, my nose would be my shield. My word, the atmosphere was loud, for there was quite a baying crowd. But then the referee set off the starting gun. I got my loaded pistol out, exploded his ginormous snout. I laid my weapon down. My work was surely done! No, alas and alack. I turned to the baying crowd, expecting the adoration I had become accustomed to. But I was shocked and bewildered to find I was being hollered at and screamed at and pelted with fruit. I was branded a bad loser whilst Bladinoff became revered. Bladinoff of all people. <laughs> Because he, he was deemed unique, and his unexpected triumph was simple. For he was the only man in the world who had no nose at all. Oh. Bladinoff berated me. He said, You underrated me, you bastard, and I idolized you. And you turned on me like this. But you have been so stupid in the way you have handled it. The press will not like you now. I told him that. <laughs> He's been a right fool. <laughs> Bladinov continued with his quips. I can't say I wasn't feeling murderous towards him. But now you pay the price for being not so very nice. He said whilst dribbling snot like mucus from a baby's cot. Bladinov was given the lap of honor on a makeshift chariot made up from people from the cock. For he was proclaimed by one and all, a lion amongst men. Whilst I, unfortunately, was branded a man amongst lions. 
for they actually set lions upon me and horses on fire! I was warned by the catalyst of this swelling scene that if I ever ventured near the cock again, I was to be buried alive. I now had an underlying feeling about being buried alive. An obsession, if you like. I struggled to get home, drinking and thinking of what could have been had I not strayed from the path. Wallowing in self-pity, I realized that I had spent so much of the fortune I had made whilst basking in the glory of being the master of nosology. I was the shadow of the man I used to be. Yes. Yes. With alcohol-fueled deliberations, I had finally found my way home to the higgledy piggledy haven on Honeycomb Hill. My father took me to my room and said I had brought such dreadful shame upon the whole community and smeared the family name. My dear mamma was cross, she said. My son, we're at a loss. Our reputation is in bits. They say that we're a shower of shits. So I attacked them with my once revered nose. This is when me and my parents came to blows. Killed them with my nose. Yes. Yes. Packs them to death. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so I attacked them with my once revered nose. This is when me and my parents came to blows. I hung them from a willow tree, their corpse is still intact. The coroner believed a local lunatic had cracked. <laughs> there was one on the loose as it goes. <laughs> as the raven flies. <laughs> For in recent times, a shady psychopath had been roaming the realms of Honeycomb Hill, committing a spate of macabre murders. Yes, yes, I could not believe I had finished them off in this way. Both of my makers lay dead on the floor, but at least their souls would be together until the end of time. As for Mama, I could not help wondering if her nose had its own song. Poor Mama. <laughs> With a nose for trouble and a yearning to put my sordid past behind me, my snout started taking a dive. My snout was used consuming sordid substances, amphetamines, shabu, and a white powder from Peru. I took all the money I could find in my father's safe and started to take all manner of substances, including cocaine, laudanum, arsenic, and all things I could consume from the remnants of my shattered nose. Yes. 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 I knew yes. this yes. would happen. Yes. As you can imagine, there was trouble ahead from the blood-soaked Higgledy-Piggledy cottage on Honeycomb Hill. I had to sell my soul to feed my demon. I sold Pa's homestead to an old retired seaman. As I wandered through the streets, I was intrepidly delirious, for my self-destruct condition was becoming rather serious. Now using arsenic pills, cheap cider thrills and meth, I sniffed and drank myself into an early death. When they found me, I was lying with my head down in the gutter. Vomit feces, nasal pieces would reveal my final splutter. 
In the asylum where they pile them on a glut of marble slabs, my diagnosis was psychosis, doses, syphilis, and crabs. The doctor turned round to the nurse and gently whispered in her ear, Bring out the body bags, for there's another gonorrhea. <laughs> You're right, doctor. He must have had a right interesting life. Oh! <laughs> Cheeky! They bagged me up, then buried me within the family plot, next to my mater and my pater, where my corpse was left to rot. Had I got what I deserved, had justice finally been served? I suggest on this occasion that was the case. Only ticky time would tell. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Yes, yes. And now I must reveal the final twist, for I had not been dead at all. My analysis, paralysis of sleep. My heart had stopped momentarily, and the medics in question were having a momentary lapse of judgment. Bastards! I woke up in my coffin feeling scared. My enveloping nightmare had finally come into fruition. For I had been buried alive! I frantically started tapping the coffin lid with my gargantuan snout. But my poor nose was surely weakening and broke with every thud. Possessed, you might have guessed. I slowly drown in my own blood! Well, I'm extremely relieved to inform you, good people, that everything I have informed you of so far transpired to be nothing more than a nightmare, a bad dream. In reality, I had no large appendage protruding from my cherubic face. I had simply fallen asleep in a bath, in a stupor that was triggered from my alcoholic haze. For I had been drinking so much ale by day and honeymead by night, in the higgledy-piggledy haven on Honeycomb Hill. T'was there I dwelt with my good wife, Matilda, and our pet cat, Pluto. Nice little boy. We loved him very much indeed. He was our replacement for a son. We had lost our own little boy in a fire, aged five years, three months, two days, and four seconds. Pluto provided my wife and me with solace as we struggled to come to terms with the grief that had been bestowed on us from on high. I miss my dead son so much, but Pluto has provided so much comfort. He's like a security blanket. I know, my dear. Thank heavens for the black cat. But one day something happened whilst I sipped on honey mead. The truth is, both my wife and I were very drunk indeed. Matilda had passed out upon her favorite rocking chair, and Pluto, for some reason, started nestling in her hair. I then began to shoo him, but the little beast ignored me as the strange effect of honey mead began to take its toll. I took a kitchen knife and I began to gouge out Pluto's eye, an action I regretted from my head down to my soul. Compounded by fear, the terrified cat prepared to flee the nest, jumping onto the mantelpiece and knocking over an array of treasured trinkets. Before I could grab the cat by the scruff of his neck, he disappeared through the back door. Little bastard. For days on end, Matilda was to question me about the disappearance of her most beloved pet. I miss Pluto very much, she said. Let's hope that we don't find him dead. My heart was filled with trepidation, sadness and regret. 
But one fine day, some three weeks later, Pluto returned, looking scrag-like and so spindly you could see his craggy carcass beneath his filthy matted fur. Matilda was delighted feeding Pluto pie and peas, prime ribeye steaks and Eccles cakes, fragois and cheddar cheese. I'm still not sure that fragois is particularly ethical, but I'll allow it on this occasion for my little Pluto. I love him so much. I love touching his tail and feeling the beat of his telltale heart. Wonderful little cat. This is surely the best day of my life. I'll even tuck into the fragoir myself. I watched on as Matilda fed her stupid loving cat. You guessed it wasn't long before the pet became quite fat. I don't like obesity at the best of times, but that cat, it was getting obese and it was getting on my nerves because it was getting more attention than I was and Matilda was my wife. It troubled me that over the ensuing months, Matilda was paying Pluto far too much attention to the point where I, the master of the house, appeared to not exist at all. But a plan was starting to formulate in my minuscule but highly active mind. Yes, yes. As Matilda fell asleep upon her favorite rocking chair, with Pluto there as usual, settled, nestling in her hair. I grabbed him by the tail and took him out beneath the sky. That's when I hung him from a pine tree with my priceless paisley tie. I trundled home to drink some mead. I felt so very pleased indeed that Pluto's neck was mangled as he dangled there to die. Yes, yes. But by and by, I also become a troubled soul. Matilda was really starting to get on my nerves. She kept bleating on about this cat of hers. It was in a heated moment, in the midst of an argument, I decided to strangle Matilda until she was dead. No, no. Not knowing what to do at all, I buried her behind the wall. Over the next few days, I kept hearing her voice in operatic form. Quite strange, really, because when she was alive, she was turned down. Anyway, the next day, I was in for a shock, for the black cat reappeared. He approached me and kept nudging me and playing little games. I was well confused because I thought I'd killed the bugger. His grinning eyes got bigger as I took to gin and ale. The white bib on his chest began to tell a ghastly tale. And the white bib began to morph into the shape of grimly fiendish gallows. What could this all mean? I slowly realized that the gallows were for me. Before I had time to finish off the cat, he seemed to disappear into thin air. Good riddance, black cat. <laughs> Convinced I had got away with it, I sat in my old armchair and began to sigh with relief. Yes. 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 But by and by, two canny coppers knocked upon my door. A stench had been reported by a local homeless whore. I smell dead flesh on Tanya. And when they knocked the wall down, they saw skeletal Matilda, the black cat nestled in her hair, proclaiming... Brother, killed her! 
And then mysteriously, once more, the cat with the gallows on its bib disappeared into the ether. As I was arrested, I was sure my fate was sealed. Another gonorrhea. So sure my course was heading for the hole when I was sentenced to the gallows pole. But then my wily lawyer made a rather clever plea. He said, my client's only half the man he used to be. The jury found me guilty but insane. I ended up committed to the lunatic's domain. <laughs> they placed me in a cell inside an imbecilic haven. That's where I met a lovely girl. Her name was Dr. Raven. Although you have a mental disorder, I think it is because you are a very bright man. And I find you rather interesting. You're a great character study, darling boy. Although I liked her very much indeed, I had self-survival on my mind. And after many consultations with her, I gained her trust. I think there's quite a lot I can do with you. I'm going to suggest to the powers that be, I see you on a far more regular basis. Mm, that's what I think, dear boy. Quoth the raven, quoth the raven. I'll call the treatment I'm giving you Nevermore, for it will mean that we will never more be interrupted. Oh, and by the way, you don't need to call me Dr. Raven. Call me by my first name, Lenore. It was during one of her psychoanalytic babblings. I shut the cell door, confiscated her keys, and gagged her mouth with a handkerchief. Oh, Robert, Robert, what are you doing, lover? Oh, Robert, oh, is it a game? Yes, yes. I tied her up and chopped off all her hair. And with my clever weaving skills, I made myself a makeshift wig, thus becoming Dr. Raven. Obviously, I ripped off all her clothes so that I could wear them myself. Although I liked her very much, I could take no chances. So I found a sharp instrument in the form of a fountain pen and stabbed her until she was dead. I must admit, she looked quite good naked. Well, very good, in fact. I found her really attractive, but necrophilia was just not my bag. <laughs> I've always had my principles, including some of the ones at school. <laughs> Feeling pleased with myself, I passed through the guards of the asylum with great ease, finding myself free once more. Fumbling my way through Lenore's handbag. I found a diary containing her address, her movements, and more importantly, a set of keys to her house. <laughs> Lucky old me. It didn't take me long to locate her wonderful house. Whilst rummaging around her underwear drawer, I bumped into a man who transpired to be her husband, George. At first, he thought I was Lenore, his wife, his angel, and his whore. He touched me on the buttock, so I smashed him in the face. Though I'm not homophobic, it's a thing I can't embrace. I picked up a nearby cleaver and chopped him up into tiny pieces. He lay there dismembered on the floor, fragments of George. Fragments of George, Georgie, Georgie Pie. Georgie, Georgie, Georgie Pie. Fragments of George on the floor. Georgie, Porgie, Porgie Pie. Kissed the raven and made a cry. Kissed the raven and made a cry. Fragments of George on the floor. Being very good with my hands, I managed to find a crowbar and take the floorboards up and embed him beneath. So George was now beneath the floor. That was his punishment for the way he had treated Lenore. In any event, 
I lived as Lenore for quite some time, in fact. Three months, four weeks, eight days and 17 seconds. I popped into the asylum quite successfully, passing myself off as the eminent doctor. I prescribed pills, I popped pills, and cured so many of all their ills. What a wonderful doctor was I. But one evening in my new homestead, I sat there drinking gin and grenadine. When I heard what appeared to be a strange pulsing sound that came from beneath the floorboards, it sounded like the pulsing of a heart. A telltale heart. A telltale heart. Yes, yes, a telltale heart. I started tearing up the planks to find it was true. It was the beating of George's hideous heart. Right from the start, I looked at his heart, his tell-tale heart. I wanted to stop it beating. So I grabbed it, but it kept throbbing in my hand. And his face appeared on the heart and laughed with all its might. <laughs> I've got you now, you murderous imposter! Said George in his new form. I looked at the heart with a view to eating it like an apple, for he was now the crab apple of my eye. But as I started to devour Georgie Porgy pudding pie, Something terrible started to happen as he expanded in my throat, and I started to choke. In fact, I was choked to death. My death was a very painful one indeed. I had been killed by the telltale heart.